Welcome to this online lesson asking the question, who could heal the sick in the Middle Ages? Our aims today are to know who could heal the sick in the Middle Ages, to explain how effective this help was, and to compare the effect effectiveness of the help available to people. Here's a do now task which is based upon some exam skills. Give two inferences you could make about medieval doctors from this source. An inference is where you get information from a source that goes beyond the blindingly obvious. So for example, if I said there appears to be one man holding another man's hand, that's not an inference, that's too obvious. So you've got to go for information you can draw from this that isn't just there. Pause the video while you have a go at this, and then we'll have a look at an example answer. So let's have a look at that do now task. In the exam, and this is particularly true in the paper three exam, you will already be given sections to fill in that look a little bit like this. I can infer and detail in the source that tells me this. This exam question is worth four marks. Firstly, you need to make a relevant inference. I can infer that some medieval doctors studied urine to make a diagnosis. Okay, there's nothing actually in that picture that says that that bottle is urine, so you're going to have to use a bit of common sense or, more hopefully, your own historical knowledge. The detail in the source that tells me this, the detail of the source that tells me this, is the bottle of liquid held by the doctor. I can also infer, I can infer that some medieval doctors were working for the church. The detail in the source that tells me this, the detail in the source that tells me this, is the doctor looks like a monk with a tonsure. A tonsure is the monk's haircut where the top of their head is bold and they've got hair around the sides. Okay, pause the video and make any improvements to your own answer that you need to. Let's move on. By way of an introduction, just as today people became sick in the Middle Ages and required treatment. The help available largely depended on how rich you were, whether you lived in the town or the countryside, and also what was wrong with you. We're going to consider the types of help available to medieval people in medieval times. We're going to create a series of top trumps for this, which can be quite an effective revision technique. It allows you to not only gather information, but also evaluate that information and express it as a rating. You'll create six top trumps cards for different medical help available in medieval times. You can create six time, uh, templates like the one on the right here. You can label it medieval healer top trumps at the top if you wish, but particularly you need to note down the name of the healer or the organization. And you could also add a basic illustration to help you. That's a process known as dual coding. And believe it or not, it does help encode it into your long term memory. So you remember it for when you really need it. Then the largest part of the available space on this sheet should be key information, treatment and the help available. Just as it does on my example here, make that the biggest part of your uh, card. Then you can offer ratings where one is no help whatsoever and 10 is brilliant help. Firstly, rate them on affordability. So is it just the rich could afford this particular treatment or could anyone? And then the effectiveness of their, their treatment from one to 10 and also their accessibility. Not quite the same as affordability there. Accessibility means was this help available to lots of people and could it be found everywhere? Lastly, give them an overall effectiveness rating out of 10. Where again, where one is no help at all and 10 is brilliant help. So what are our six different features? The first is the physician better known as a doctor today. Next, the apothecary, then the wise woman, the barber surgeon, hospitals, and also help available in the home. If you want to make your templates first, then pause the video here and do that. If not, you could make them one at a time or structure your notes in an exercise book or something. It really is up to you. Pause the video if you need to. Let's complete our first card on the physician. A physician is just a medical doctor and someone who we might more ordinarily call a doctor today. But seeing as you can become a doctor in all sorts of subjects at university, it's not particularly helpful in a medical sense to just call them doctors. There were only around 100 physicians in all of England and all of them were men. They were trained at university medical school for seven years, learning the works of ancient doctors like Hippocrates and Galen and the Islamic doctors Ibn Sina and Al-Razi, who they called Avicenna and Razis. They were banned from dissection in training, that's dissecting human bodies and cutting them up. So they knew very little about the human body other than what they read in their textbooks. They carried something called the Vademecum. Uh, this was like a handbook of diagnoses that were used for the four humours, urine chart and astrology in diagnosis and treatment. 
Again, this is a bit of a uh, hangover from uh, what Hippocrates did with his clinical ob observation and diagnosis. They used clinical observation, took the pulse and examined the whole body, much as Hippocrates instructed. But they were very expensive. Only the rich can afford them, and typically only in towns and cities. OK, pause the video here and complete your first top trumps card, remembering to give ratings for things like affordability, the, the chance of success for their treatment and effectiveness, and also how accessible they were. OK, let's move on to the next. Physicians are sufficiently important in medieval medicine that you'll probably want to make some notes elsewhere rather than just on a small card. So if you haven't already got lots of detailed knowledge about the physician, now's a chance to grab another piece of paper or another file and start to make some wider notes. Physicians based their main ideas about illness on ancient ideas. This meant most treatments were about balancing the humours. This is something they would have learned at university. Here are some examples. A person who was thought to be sanguine had too much blood. Physicians regularly performed bloodletting, using cuts and even leeches to remove blood from the body. This was thought to encourage good health, even in the already healthy. Quite famously, monks were bled regularly because they felt it made them less likely to desire things like red meat and women. Someone who was melancholic might have been believed to have too much black bile. Laxative me medicines, which, let's be honest, wouldn't have made them go to the toilet, would have been used to try and balance that. Similarly, blistering the skin and using purgatives to make people sick were believed to balance the humours. The theory of opposites was used as well. Remember, this was one of Galen's theories, e.g. using hot ingredients for chills. And medicines would be supplied by an apothecary, who we'll learn about a little bit later. Pause the video and make any additional notes that you need to, either on your top, trump, top trumps card or if you've run out of space elsewhere. We'll finish off by having a look at some of the main ideas that people had about living a healthy lifestyle. Doctors would have carried something called the Regimen Sanitatis, which basically translates as the clean way of living. You might recognise some of this advice as being still useful today and others less so. However, you can note down some of this advice or sum it up in a paragraph or two. So what did the Regimen Sanitatis actually advise? Take moderate exercise. Do not overeat. Adjust your diet to the amount of exercise that you do. Make sure you get enough sleep, but not too much. Avoid stress. Keep clean with regular bathing. Breathe clean, eastern or northerly air. Live away from your animals and not too close to the ground floor. Avoid excessive cold, heat, dryness or humidity. That one there is very much linked to the idea of the four humours. Stay on friendly terms with your neighbours. Do not have too much sex. And avoid barking dogs, drunks and bandits, since these can cause anxiety and therefore disease. You can see here that there's a big link between the humours and moods and that therefore causing disease. OK, pause here and you can note down some of the terms of the Regimen Sanitatis to add to your notes and your understanding of what doctors believed and also what they advised. I'm sure you'll agree there's plenty in there which we would probably take to heart today. OK, Chop Chumps card number two, the apothecary. Lots of people struggle to say that word for some, uh, for some reason, apothecary. The apothecary is a little bit like a modern day pharmacist, only with far less training. They were trained in herbs and medicines, but had actually no real medical qualifications. They tended to learn it either from books or from other apothecaries. They were similar to a pharmacist or chemist today. They mixed various ingredients to produce medicines for the physicians, a bit like a prescription today. However, they also made up their own mixtures for a price. It was cheaper to see the apothecary than having to consult a physician, so it was slightly more affordable. They were almost certainly a man. They were most common in the towns and cities. Most reasonable sized towns would have had some sort of apothecary. Sometimes you can still see streets which are named after them. Where I live in Great Torrington, there's a street called Potacre Street. Originally, that meant Apothecary Street. So clearly, even a small town like Torrington had a, an apothecary. Pause the video and add notes to your top trumps card now and add ratings. Oh, but unlike the doctor, we're not going to do a whole load of extra notes to the apothecary.
done. Let's move on. What about the barber's surgeon? Not like a surgeon you would find today. You may have seen the barber's pole outside of a barber's shop before. The pole that is still displayed outside a barber's shop is medieval in origin. It represents the bloody bandages of the barber's work, which are often hang, hung outside to dry. In a pre-literate society where people couldn't read, usually there would be a picture of whatever was on offer in a, sh uh, a shop, much as you might see a sign outside of a pub today. So that's the origin of the barber's pole. But what did the barber's surgeon actually do? Barber surgeons were not trained or respected by physicians, but if literate, they may have read books. What was certain, though, is they almost always had lots of experience. Even today in um, Britain, surgeons are often referred to as Miss or Mister. This relates back to the idea that they were not granted the title Doctor. Although, don't make any mistakes, these days these are highly qualified people, at least as qualified as doctors, if not more so. It's just a weird tradition that dates back to the Middle Ages. The barber surgeon could do all sorts of things. They could pull out bad teeth, they could let blood to try and balance your humours, they could lance boils and remove uh, move external tuners, tubers rather, uh, as well as provide uh, hair and beard trims. Indeed, the term barber comes from the Latin term for a beard. They could do basic surgery, such as amputating limbs. That might not sound very basic, but in the way that they did it, it was pretty much as shown in that cartoon. Hold the person down who would be screaming and as quickly as possible just saw the leg off. Speed was valued over caution. They used no anaesthetic and antiseptics and they had a very low success rate for surgery. Typically people might die of shock and the pain or they might die from blood loss or they might die from infection. They were the cheapest surgery available and they were again mostly found in towns. OK, pause the video here. And just like last time, make up your top trumps card for the barber surgeon. On to the next one. The wise woman. As the name suggests, these were female. They could train to be a midwife, but they needed the bishop's permission first. They could qualify as a surgeon, but they were not allowed to be a physician or attend university. They could be either a rich or a poor woman. They often help with childbirth. And they use some herbal remedies and some charms and spells. Although this could carry risks of actually accusations of witchcraft. So women had to be careful. Wise women were cheap and accessible. Every village had one. You could imagine the household saying, oh, such and such is sick. Don't worry, such and such down the street, the wise woman, she's got a remedy for that. And so they would have been a well-known person within the community. Like we've done before, pause the video here and complete your uh, top trumps card on the wise woman. OK, only a couple more to go. We're going to spend a little bit more time in detail on medieval hospitals and study some sources as well. The first hospital in England, or at least the first recorded one, was created in 1123, St Bartholomew's in London. St Bart's, believe it or not, in one form or another, is still going today. At first, hospitals were set up by monasteries. They were run by monks who cared for older people. This developed when new, smaller hospitals were set up by guilds and wealthy townspeople. These cared for local civilians and guild members, for example, shoemakers. It's a little bit like being in a trade union today. You can make some notes on this right away. Also, by 1400, there were 200 hospitals across the country. So if you lived in a larger town or city, you probably had access to some sort of hospital. Let's consider some sources to get a better idea of the sort of treatments available. It wasn't all good news. What does this painting tell us about medieval hospitals? This is a source from the era of the Black Death, or at least that's what I suppose those people are with those buboes all over them. It's possible that they're lepers too, because there were leper hospitals all over England. Perhaps we've noticed that there are monks and nuns caring for them, much as nurses do today, but they wouldn't necessarily have had the same training. Add some notes to your top trumps card now, or elsewhere. We've got a monk here. We can see that this monk appears to be handing out some sort of medicine. We also have nuns working here, much like nurses. 
the division of labour was really that the nurses or uh, the nuns rather would work much like nurses, whereas the monks would more deal with the kind of spiritual needs of the patients. We can also see that prayers are being given here. Prayer was a crucial component of healing within the hospital. Here's another hospital. This one here shows a 16th century uh, hospital in France. That's a little bit after the medieval period, but the principles are pretty much the same. The original term hospital related to hospitality, in other words, somewhere to stay, not just for necessarily sick people, but maybe old people or pil people on pilgrimages who are traveling a long distance. There are a couple more hints about the effectiveness of the treatment here, though. though. Firstly, we can see again here a nurse or nun is giving out some medicine or possibly some food. We can also see the central role of religion in running these places. There's Christ at the back. And we can also see how overcrowded these places could be. Beds were typically shared, not particularly good for preventing the spread of infectious, infectious disease. And much like hospitals today, sadly, not everyone made it. Although it's not entirely clear, this does look like people being wrapped out, up into funeral shrouds, which the poor would typically get instead of the coffin at this time. All right, add to your notes again before we move on. Hopefully you've got an idea of the effectiveness of the medieval hospital now. Here's an example of a surviving hospital. Doesn't look much like one that we'd have today. This is in the town of Faversham in Kent. It's on the main road between London and Canterbury, an important traveller or pilgrim's route during the Middle Ages. Indeed, it's based upon a Roman road, so it's a truly ancient route. The Maison Dieu literally means House of God, which showed the religious connection of hospitals with the, 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 the church. So why is it by the road? Well, typically this Maison Dieu was all about serving the needs of the pilgrims who were travelling to the tomb of St. Thomas in Canterbury. You can see the direction of the road there. Our last top trumps card is the home. This is probably where most people would have received their treatment. Women in the home were probably then the healthcare that the vast majority of ordinary people experienced. Like the wise woman, herbal and other remedies would have been learned by women and used in the home, often passed down from one generation to another. It is likely that very minor surgery might even have been done in the home too though few records survive, probably as it was taken for granted that women were the healers in the home. Here's a source that helps demonstrate this. This is an extract for, uh, from a letter by Margaret Paston to her husband John Paston, written in 1464. The Pastons were a wealthy family, and at this time John was in London. For God's sake, beware of any medicine that you get from any physicians in London. I shall never trust them because of what happened to your father and my uncle, whose souls God forgive. Presumably from this, it seems like the Pastons family has had rather a bad experience with the apothecaries and the physicians and don't really trust them that much. They would be far better at home with Mrs Paston looking after John. She's showing genuine concern for him here. And when she says, whose souls God forgive, it implies that the father and the uncle must have died from something. Anyway, take some final notes onto your top trumps cards and hopefully you'll recognise that the home is probably the most accessible and most affordable treatment of all. Done? Okay, time to move on. Let's do a quick check to make sure you've got most of the main points. If you can complete this task, you probably have. These are four of the different things that we've been looking at. Here are some facts about them. All you need to do is match the heads to the tails. Then we'll go through some answers. Pause the video now while you attempt that. As an extension, explain the link between the head and the tail. So the wise woman needs a license from the church to perform one job. Which was it? Becoming a midwife. The barber surgeon is a jack of all trades, but a master of none. Not qualified, but can do an awful lot for a fee. What about the physician? That's the only one that's actually been to university and got a formal qualification. And therefore the apothecary is the person who will provide medicines for a fee. We're going to follow up a little bit now on surgery in a wider sense, 
not just the barber surgeon, but surgery in the Middle Ages in, in a more wide sense anyway. Surgery made some surprising progress in the Middle Ages. In a time of frequent war, surgeons' skills were much in demand, and as a result, their skills increased. Prince Henry, who later became Henry V, was saved by his surgeon John Bradmore after an arrow pierced his skull. This is why Henry V is shown as a side profile in his official portrait. Medieval surgeries could do some complex external surgery, from removing eye cataracts or trepanning. This means drilling a hole in the skull to remove demons and to help with epilepsy. Well, actually, what we really know was done by this is it relieved pressure on the brain, and that's why it worked. However, complex surgery in the body was not often attempted, as this was too risky. Medieval surgery made progress as they realised how uh, to use wine as an antiseptic and natural substances such as opium and, or hemlock as anaesthetics and honey to clean the wounds. Although it should be noted that not everyone really understood these things and they were still pretty risky. Hemlock is a powerful poison, for example. However, surgeons still had no idea that dirt carried disease, so surgeries were often filthy. Incidentally, a barber surgeon prided himself on the filthiness of his clothes. If he was covered in blood, but it showed that he had performed those operations many times before, and it actually would have provided some confidence. Also, they could not prevent infections or stop heavy bleeding. Therefore, most deaths came from this. As they were not trained, they knew very little about anatomy, but would use the wound man, like the illustration on the right there, to give advice on how to deal with different wounds. Some follow-up tasks then. On your own copy of this text, highlight the strengths of medieval surgery in one colour and the limitations in another. Or, if you don't have a copy, make bullet-pointed notes with quotes from the text under those headings. As an example, here's one strength and one limitation. Pause the video and complete that task now. Okay, so surgery wasn't all bad news, but it should be realised that the deeper they had to cut and the longer the operation, the more dangerous it was for the person. We're now going to have a look at applying this knowledge to an exam-style question. Describe two features of a medieval hospital. To answer this, you just need to give two relevant features with some supporting extra detail or explanation. Pretty straightforward, really. In the exam, you'll even be given two little boxes with headings to write this in. Feature 1 and Feature 2. It's only four marks, so spend only five to six minutes completing this. Pause the video while you attempt this question. Hopefully that wasn't too difficult. Let's have a look at an example answer. Here's my first example. One feature of a medieval hospital is that they were often run by the church. Many of the people who worked there were monks or nuns. Okay, so that's one relevant feature and the supporting detail. Another feature of a medieval hospital is that they might care for pilgrims as well as the sick. Hospitals had large dormitories for people to sleep and recover in. A dormitory is basically like a large shared bedroom. It's only four sentences, but that would still get me my four marks. If you're able to complete those questions in less than six minutes, then great, it just leaves you extra time for the longer questions. Let's have a go at another one. Describe two features of a medieval apothecary. Again, only four marks. Just give two relevant features with some supporting extra detail or explanation. There are your headings. Have a go at this one. Pause the video while you attempt that. Hopefully you're finding these reasonably straightforward. The only real trip up that you can make with this is by not reading the question properly and therefore choosing irrelevant examples. Let's have a look at my sample answer. One feature of apothecaries is that they created medicines. These might be their own mixtures or medicines ordered by a physician. Another feature of apothecaries is that they would create medicines for a price. Apothecaries charge for the ingredients of their medicines and their knowledge of how to mix and use them. If you need to improve your own answer, then pause the video now. If not, we'll move on. Finally, answer the following. Which place or person, in your view, was the most effective at treating medieval illnesses? Which place or person was most accessible to the majority of medieval people? And in your view, could most medieval people get effective treatment for illness? Whatever your opinions on those different questions, explain all your answers. Once you've done that, that will be the end of this lesson. I'll say thank you very much for watching. I hope it's been useful and interesting to you. 
If it has, then please like this video and subscribe to the channel for even more. I'll say thank you once more and say goodbye and good health.